This is Nina Curley of Wamda Media. I'm here on the Geeks on a Plane bus. So it's more like Geeks on a Bus right now. Um, just coming back from the event that we had today um, at Oasis 500, our first Wamda Mix and Mentor event in Amman um, with Geeks on a Plane. So I'm sitting here with Dave McClure, the founder of 500 Startups and an international troublemaker. Dave, how are you? Uh, I'm doing great. Excellent. Um, so let's just chat about the day today. Um, did you see anything that particularly stood out to you? Uh, well, I think just in general, being able to meet with a lot of different companies, uh, it was actually pretty surprising how many folks had really you know, strong ideas for their businesses and even in some cases had uh, customers and revenue already. How did you get inspired to start 500 Startups? I wasn't necessarily inspired to start 500 Startups. I just couldn't get a job anyplace else. So it was pretty much my, uh, if I wanted a job in venture capital, I had to start my own company. <laughs> Maybe not try yet too. And what companies do you focus on incubating there? Um, well, so we're both a uh, seed fund and an incubation uh, acceleration firm. So we run our own accelerator program twice a year in uh, Silicon Valley and Mountain View with about 30 companies each batch. Um, but we also do a pretty significant number of investments in seed rounds uh, from other companies that come from other accelerators or even don't go through accelerators in you know places in California and all over the world. Uh, currently doing about 150 maybe investments per year or so. And we have a uh, presence in Brazil, Mexico, and India, uh, hopefully a few other places uh, by early next year as well. Uh, also in New York. Very cool. And um, what are the biggest opportunities that you see um, on, in the global tech startup scene? Well, a lot of our uh, fund's investment thesis is based on uh, making lots of little bets in companies that don't require that much capital to get off the ground. So a lot of software, internet, mobile, web businesses uh, where mostly the cost structure is around the headcount and hopefully those businesses can you know be built into product or service companies that can generate revenue fairly quickly from customers um, a lot of areas we focus on tend to be consumer commerce focused companies uh, sometimes subscription SaaS, uh, business services in the cloud and uh, also recently more looking at family parents uh, education topics for kids and families uh, all of those, in our opinion, have pretty strong and clear revenue models, so a lot of things we do are either transactional subscription or lead gen, which uh, just simplifies uh, revenue model, reduces risk for us in having to figure that part of it out. Um, so there's some differences in the international opportunities than from domestic U.S. opportunities, although in the long run I think there's more similar than different. Do you advise a Jordanian entrepreneur differently than you would advise an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley about what opportunities to pursue? Uh, you know, the playing field's probably a little bit different. I think, you know, certainly if you look at the overall Arabic-speaking market, there might be 300 to 500 million people. You know, there's, there's some challenges in implementing e-commerce and a few other things right now, but in the long run, you know, say two, three, five years, those markets look really attractive and currently are not at all, you know, played out in terms of opportunity. So I might, you know, advise a local Jordanian entrepreneur to at least look at the, you know, Middle Eastern market as an opportunity that's big enough to not, you know, skip. Um, at the same time, there may be global or U.S. domestic opportunities for folks that are open and available to entrepreneurs anywhere in the world. So the one thing that's different, I think, when you're looking at e-commerce businesses in uh, developing markets, uh, you have challenges with having widespread payment uh, financial service adoptions uh, that you don't in the U.S. So in the U.S. a lot of people have credit card instruments and ability to pay online in developing markets, maybe in China, Brazil, India, places like in the Middle East, it's maybe not uh, as much availability there. Uh, similarly on delivery and logistics, you may have some challenges in figuring out um, how to get the products to people as well. So there's certainly a different playbook for folks who are operating in, you know, developing markets versus, you know, Western or U.S. markets. Finally, what do you love the most about what you do? <laughs> uh, I get to travel around the world and uh, talk to the smartest people on the planet. What's, uh, what's not great about that? Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. It was really a pleasure to have you guys here and created some really great discussions. So we hope to see you back here again sometime. Thanks.